Paul Raftery, corporate partner at Waitman's, a national head of our own managed business group. We're hosting a series of webinar blogs where we speak to our clients about their experiences in relation to COVID. And today for a change, we thought we'd start and discuss how we've handled the situation. And I'm delighted that my uh, managing partner, John Scorer, has agreed to be interviewed by yours truly and his Paxman guys. So John, I can introduce you to our listeners. Um, yeah. Perhaps for the benefit of, of those who don't know us as well as others, you could give a little bit of background about our business generally. So uh, we're a UK focused national law firm uh, where we have eight offices in normal circumstances um, around the country, uh, where we provide a very wide range of legal and business solutions uh, to clients in the owner managed business space, corporates, built environment uh, businesses, insurance companies, public sector bodies and private clients. Um, so we're the, really the main six segments, as we call it, we operate in. Um, uh, our business is pretty much all UK based. Uh, we've got about 1300 people. Um, and really our purpose is to try and see the possibility of things so we can deliver results for our clients and success for our people. There's a tagline if I ever heard one. Um, how do you say we've, we've fared then, John, since the, the pandemic hit? And obviously I've got my take on that, but um, what can we share with, with our listeners? Yeah. Well, we, we've had challenges. You know, we've not been immune. Um, it's, it, there's been some difficulties for us, um, like everyone else, really. Um, we did go into the crisis with a really strong trading period and had sort of a track record of some considerable growth over the previous um, uh, 12 months or so. Um, comes as no surprise that's pretty much come to a halt um, we've seen a drop off in work from clients as you would expect because our clients have got their own challenges um, you know they're going to be watching their cash and be careful about the the legal spend and that's had an effect but also things like institutions the courts and the tribunals where we do a lot of business um, you know they've implemented reduced access and availability for hearings so that's had an impact on us as well but we've not so we have been affected, but I don't think we've seen the drop off in activity that, predict, that was, has been predicted on a national or global basis as far as averages across business generally is concerned. I think we've done a, a bit better um, at the moment. Um, in fact, we're currently trading slightly ahead of where we thought we would be, but it's very early days. Um, I, we're, we're doing well because I think our people and our clients have been amazing, um, but there is a long way to go. Um, I think you know we were all talking two months ago about ticks and quick upturns. Um, I'm beginning to think that it's going to be a longer haul and we might see a more gradual, longer trough. Um, and that's meant we've had to address some cost because the business has been geared to provide support for growth, not a period of contraction. But overall, um, it, it's it's got got a lot harder, but we're we're doing we're doing okay. Can you confirm the stats we've taken, John, over the last few months to adjust the business? Very cool. I mean, yeah, well, we, we, we decided to do three things very quickly. Um, the first thing was we wanted to make, ensure we could maintain, you know, first class operations and services to the clients. Whilst making sure all our people are okay and looking after their well-being. Um, five of our offices of the eight, um, which is the vast majority of the 1,300 people we've got, already had the ability to work remotely or agilely uh, before the lockdown. So most of our people had uh, the equipment and the technology to work from home already. Um, so just prior to lockdown, we started organizing kit for the rest. So literally within one or two days of lockdown, the entire business was able to operate virtually. Um, all our systems and comms worked 100% remotely right away. We closed seven of our eight offices. We left a small skeleton staff in one to handle posts and checks in a safe environment. And well over 99% of our people have been safe at home working. Um, so that was the first thing we did was make sure that we were um, up and running operationally very quickly. So I guess the one thing I would say about that is your know, cash is tight for everybody, but if at all possible, avoid stopping investing in IT. Um, the second thing we did was, these aren't normal times, as we know. Um, so we decided we needed some very different guidelines to how we make our decisions and plan and communicate. That, that is the case. 
Um, you know, I think every business has to manage for uncertainty pretty much all the time. But this has been a different set of circumstances, as we all know, fairly unique. Um, so the board, we, we, we established what we called eight guiding principles as a framework for making decisions. Um, the first thing was safety and well-being of our people has to be paramount. Secondly, um, sustaining the business in the long term comes only after that safety and well-being of our people. So we made it very clear we wouldn't make short-term decisions that will prejudice our long-term prospects. Um, the old adage, cash first, profit second, revenue third, we made the decision that we wouldn't buy in work or go for a race to the bottom just to try and continue to be busy where there's been a, a downturn in trade. Um, when it comes to things like furlough, redeployment of people and business restructuring, we decided it would be done with absolute transparency, fairness and integrity and maintain the maximum amount of jobs that we can. And that was really important as a focus. Um, our clients, will remain always at the heart of what we do and we have to make it very clear that service can't be adversely affected but be willing to have open and honest conversations with clients about their real needs and what they is really essential at these times and um, as i explained before and the first thing that we did doing everything to maintain our infrastructure so we could operate remotely and get ready for when we're back into the office environment and being agile and flexible moving people around where we need to um, when it came to discretionary spend and overheads, they were the things that we decided we would look at pretty robustly in taking decisions before decisions on reducing pay, working hours and structural change. And finally, we wanted to make sure that there were benefits from this and use the experience to come out more efficient and effective in the future. So that was the second thing, setting these guiding principles out, having already the first thing made sure that we were operating very quickly at 100% uh, as a remote business and virtual business. And the third thing was comms and people. And we decided a very hands-on approach. It was, you know, it, it was a lot of talking to people early days, daily comms about practical things, how to work remotely, what the furlough plans would uh, be about. People find it hard to take a lot in. Uh, so we began to then theme them on different things, different days, not always every day, but also repeating certain things talking to the staff about the guiding principles and why we were making the decisions that we were going to make. Um, and then as time went on, provided people with different types of more specific um, support. So for example, managing people remotely is a very different skill set than managing people in an office. So we offered support around that and then also how to deal with remote working uh, patterns. So I think on the third thing with comms, um, I think what I would say is, is far better to do too much than not enough in these sorts of circumstances. I think you've um, you've answered the question I was asking you next, actually, there, John, which is about how we've managed engagement, welfare, and productivity. Um, I think through an awful lot of comms with with clients, but with staff rather. Is, is there more you'd like to touch on that? Or yeah, I think you know I talked about comms. I think the novelty of the comms wore off very quickly, as did Zoom. Um, but it's really important you keep that up and have these virtual meetings. Um, uh, and I make no apology, or we made no apologies for repetition about that. Um, and we got great feedback from the staff um, about being very upfront about the, uh, the challenges. Um, we also, with remote work and increased online training, we had more virtual social events and blogs. We encouraged and facilitated to keep fit regimes, etc. But the other thing about the staff was that, you know, we all know remote working can be tough. You know, a lockdown's created a lot of pressures for people. Isolation can be really hard if you're uh, living on your own. Um, trying to work from home on your laptop, on your lap, while you've got two young kids running around and your partner's uh, doing a, a, a critical job working for the NHS or what have you. Um, having concern about your elderly uh, relatives. All this can bring on a lot of pressure to people. So um, prior to lockdown, we've been an early adopter of wellbeing and mental health awareness. So, um, and we, we have, pre-lockdown trained 50 mental health first aiders so one of the other things that we did was set up a dedicated confidential email address so anybody who wanted to could talk to a mental health first aider uh, about anything um, uh, we've given everybody an extra week's holiday this year uh, as well as allowing people to carry over more holiday um, to try and help alleviate the stress and also as far as work stress is concerned and um, uh, try and help in that, uh, in that respect. We've removed any individual performance targets this year 
and just focus solely on team goals so people can feel a little less under scrutiny at the time when it's pretty tough working at home, often in isolation. Um, we have used the government uh, job retention scheme, furlough, as it's called. It's been really helpful in maintaining jobs um, because we do envisage an upturn and we need to be ready to mobilise when that upturn comes. Um, I did mention earlier that we had to make some cuts and some of that has been salary pay cuts. We hope that will be temporary. We have uh, implemented a recruitment freeze. Um, staff have been amazing. We avoided the need for formal consultation. And I think a lot of that was explaining why we were doing what we were doing and explaining the guiding principles that the hierarchy of decisions was all about trying to maintain the maximum amount of jobs. Um, we have a transition plan um, with our own tests for reinstating full levels of pay and also re um, restoring investments. Uh, and then finally, the other thing is, it's really important that the most senior people in the business took a much greater proportion of the pay than they have. Thank you, John. Um, to the clients, um, what steps have you say the firm's taken to engage with clients and, and how have they reacted? And what specific well, do you think has worked well for us in that regard? Perhaps less so. Yeah, well, I, I think specifically, you know, uh, yeah. As I mentioned in the intro, we've got a very wide book of clients range from individuals and small businesses to large institutions and public sector bodies. And I think, you know, it doesn't matter big or small, this pandemic has uh, affected pretty much all business, although for some clients in different ways and they've needed different things. Um, I think it's been really important that, you know, specifically again, we've been really authentic with the clients about what they need and what they don't need. Um, uh, we've had this major disruption and it's important to think that we do sh stand shoulder to shoulder with them. So we developed this thing called the Coronavirus Advice Response Emergency Support Service called CURS um, to let clients get access to expertise quickly uh, around critical things that may be causing them real issues. So things like uh, advice on uh, has the virus and this pandemic uh, created force majeure events or frustration of contracts, what they do about deliberate and voluntary closure or suspension of trading premises or services, in employment, what, what are the right circumstances and what's reasonable to furlough staff, what's the you know, general contractual position with their ongoing obligations, as trade diminishes, directors and officers have uh, duties their own and what happens as uh, profits reduce. Um, what's the uh, effect of business interruption insurance, et cetera, a whole range of things, even the availability for some of our social um, care clients around the adequate uh, availability of PPE, et cetera. And made sure that all of that is available readily and even actually not just to clients, but there's lots of stuff on the website that's accessible to all. So that's some of the specific stuff. But I think um, the other thing that we learned was that in having to do all this stuff remotely that reaching out and maintaining communication even more frequently than previously and it's shown the strength of the relationships we've got with our clients and it's enabled us to give the, have the opportunity to showcase the full range of services that we can support clients and their businesses on from insurance advice to commercial and corporate services right across to private client work it actually created quite a lot of opportunities for us i'd agree with that um in terms of our other relationships, um, how have we managed those with this, our stakeholders, such as funders? Well, uh, you know, uh, across the board, if you talk with our, starting with our landlords, um, uh, majority we've got IS offices, as I said, most of them are institutional <coughs> landlords, and they've been very supportive. Um, most people will know landlords tend to work on a quarterly rent in advance. Um, uh, they've allowed us, like most of the tenants, to move to monthly rental in advance, which has helped smooth cash flow. And some of our very large uh, corporate IT suppliers have been receptive to making our cash less lumpy and evening out payments for them. But as far as other suppliers in general, you know, they've got their own pressures. There are partners we want to work with them and particularly, um, you know, uh, the smaller suppliers, we made sure that we're there to support them. And it's been BAU for us as far as their trading terms are concerned. Um, we have had to look at cutting discretionary spend, as I mentioned in the guiding principles. So some su suppliers where we have work on and off, there's been less of that, unfortunately. Um, um, as far as the funders and that are concerned, currently, uh, the, the other steps that we've taken has meant that um, there's been no need 
for additional short-term working capital. <coughs> um, you might ask, have we attempted to access any government supported bank loans or schemes? Um, our bank been incredibly supportive uh, and we are looking at what requirements we may need further down the line. Uh, as I say, currently we're operating well within our credit line, but you know, another old adage is it's always better to ask for an umbrella when you don't need it. Um, never a true thing said about our friends, uh, uh, the funders. Um, what I would say is, from our experience in talking to funders, is going to assume the C-bills or other government-backed schemes are more attractive than the standard funder BAU terms. It may, they may be, they may not be. And just be careful and be very selective about that. Almost, we're <clears throat> all hoping to see, you know, the, the, the increased pace of the emergence out from the yeah. um, Obviously, that, that creates problems and pressures of its own. So, as lockdown does ease, um, what are our plans for the business in, its, in this next phase? Um, okay. yeah, I think um, in the immediate future, I mean, I'm crystal ball that isn't here, but I think it's unlikely, uh, or it's likely rather, sorry, shall I say, that the government is going to continue to recommend those that can work at home, stay at home, and continue to work from home, avoid the risk of spreading infection through travelling on public transport and contact in the office environment. So. That being the case for the immediate future, which could be still for us months, not weeks, um, we'll continue working as we are. But we will accommodate clients' needs. And you know, if we need to be in the office or you know, at court or visiting the clients, we will. Um, but I think certainly short term, the actual day-to-day -day stuff might not change. Um, we need to think about the return to work though, and we are, and we're looking at a raft of measures. Um, looking at things like specific location risk assessments, limiting the number of staff on any site, closing some facilities, cordoning off areas uh, and desks, increasing the use of flexible working, clear signage, and, and just making sure we reinforce all the key messages. Um, again, going back to staff and comms, talking to them to make them feel safe and secure, listening to their ideas, and um, thinking about identifying specific vulnerabilities, um, you know, I'm managing certain high risk groups as per government advice in terms of health. So, um, you know, people with BAME backgrounds, the elderly workforce, overweight, and, and also some of our locations where the levels of infection may remain high. Got to look at all of those things. And then we've got to think about risk, which I think comes into three areas, really regulatory, reputational and actual safety risk. Um, you know, we, we do this for a living um, as far as health and safety advice is concerned. And as a business, we, we, we think that, you know, there will be regulatory action by the HSC for those who don't take meaningful steps to implement the guidance. So it's important you, we, you don't pay lip service to it and we won't be paying lip service to it. And even to the point of um, thinking about disciplinary or considering disciplinary action, actions against staff employees where there's evidence of willful or repeated non-compliance, because ultimately, you know, it's us on the hook for those sorts of things. Uh, so that's regulatory risk, and get that right. Hopefully, reputational risk will look after itself if you don't cut corners. Best way to avoid reputation management issues is to appear to best practice, adhere to best practice. Um, prevention is better than cure. So, and it's really important for us because we have very high profile contracts and you know public sector relationships. So we have to maintain the high standards of business. So look at some specific things, but also around risk generally is what we're at. And uh, I, I think um, hopefully that will hold us in good stead. Uh, safety risk also, there's one thing that we can't control, and that is um, when our staff and people are uh, in the places we do not control. So travel, court visits, client visits. Um, we, we will continue to discourage use of public transport. Uh, we'll remind people to make, I think the experts will call it dynamic risk assessment uh, when they're going to visit other places, maintain social distancing, hand hygiene, and otherwise follow government guidance. Thanks, John. Is there any support or, or further guidance you think the government specifically ought to be issuing now or certainly over the next few months to, to further help in that sort of return to work? Um, I think. Uh, a general observation is that support for business has been one of the better things that the government has done. Um, uh, uh, but 
I, I would have said that pops perhaps a little bit more clarity around furlough, uh, but that seems to be shaping up. We are still in a in a situation where things are a little bit fuzzy around the actual return to work stuff, and there does need to be more clarity and more transparency about it. Um, I think, generally speaking, um, I think the only other thing I would say about the government is. Um, in the long term, I think we have to be prepared that we've got to pay for all of this in more tax. Yeah, I think that's got to be true. Um, but finally, John, um, lessons learned. Um, the last few months have clearly changed our plans for the future. Um, can you give some indication about in the ways in which that's happened and, and, and why? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, there's some very specific practical things first um, uh, that you know, we, we were, when we came into this, we were, you know, a sort of a paper-like business. I think we've realized that we can do without paper pretty much completely. So we'll become a, um, a paperless business. I think we will travel less. So, um, you know, it will reduce our carbon pr footprint. I think um, our people will be given more flexibility so they can reduce the need to travel to work and the expense to travel to work. I think people still want to go to work, to be clear. I don't think you know, it will become a complete virtual environment because um, I don't think it will be a good thing. But I think that um, uh, it will drive us to become more efficient, which has got to be good because that makes us more competitive, which is better for our clients too. Um, I think we were on this sort of digital journey um, around offering more products and services on a digital basis and also uh, collaborating with clients on a digital basis. I think what this is doing is going to accelerate things. It was going to happen anyway, but I certainly think um, it'll accelerate things as uh, time goes on. Um, we've, in the short term, had to rethink about investment, uh, particularly to preserve cash um, and see how things settle down. But as I explained in our guiding principles, um, we won't do anything short term that's going to affect our long term sustainability. Um, we, are, we were looking to grow through acquisition before this, and I do think coming out of this will be more drivers for consolidation with savings on premises, infrastructure, and economies of scale uh, in investment in technology. But I guess you have to pause and think, what does a, a, a national network of offices mean? Uh, you know, how can you, what, what will a national law firm mean in, in this world of more digital interaction? Uh, will we see more competition from so-called online disruptors? I think that's possibly going to be the case, um, but clients still want relationships and geography and close working will continue to play a part. Uh, they still want a depth of service as well as resource. Um, uh, they may become a little bit more relaxed where the resource comes from now that they've seen how people can work uh, remotely in this way. Um, uh, larger law firms, I think, will continue to have the advantage of collaboration on a larger scale. And I think that will drive more innovation for us in how we work with the clients. So I think there's some real positives that's going to speed up the change for us delivering even more results for our clients and even more success for our people. That, that didn't sound like a closing line that was pre-planned, but no. I'm sure it was. Thank you, John. Um, I hope everyone, you found that uh, an interesting take on how we as a firm have handled the, the, the issues for our business. Um, we are in that time on the phrase open for business very much and look forward to continuing to support our clients um, as they go forward. And I hope the next time um, we, we get to speak to you, Mr. Scorer, he's had his hair cut. Really you, you never know. You never know. You never know. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. And I wish everybody the uh, greatest success possible in these times, which aren't easy for anyone. And uh, thank you all for your support. Take care now. Thank you.